Um, outside of the personalization, the changes that you think you'll see, do you feel that the program is preparing you for the real world well enough? Or do you think that maybe that our program should be split it's a year long year and a half long program let's do six months of curricular activity and then maybe it's visiting different types of facilities whether it's going to a crematory going to a prep center like you did at flanner and buchanan where you get to see the embalming side I think it would be neat if you guys spent some time with the cemetery association to see the cemetery side of it, how that all works for them. Um, we did do that. You did do some yeah. field trips? Um, we went to, I'm trying to think of the name, up in Indy. It's a really big cemetery. Crown Point? Yes, yeah. Crown Point. And we got all the information we got to see their embalming room um how they run their cemetery we actually spoke to the cemetery manager yeah um and we got a little bit of everything from them yeah it's pretty neat mm -hmm. so we did some field trips we went to a crematory we went to some manufacturers um we went to a funeral home that wasn't what i would consider for me as a traditional funeral home, we went to a Jewish funeral home. So it was a different um, environment. Um, it was kind of neat to see every door was labeled um, in English, Braille and Hebrew. Um, it was interesting to see that they had an embalming room that they don't use and the state required them to have an embalming machine and embalming chemicals. <laughs> Their religion doesn't believe in it. He had a special washing room to wash the bodies to go through that um, Kevra Kadisha process, the washing and cleansing and dressing of the body. Um, so it, it, it's definitely important to see some of those other aspects of the industry, but I think that maybe there are our educational system for funeral service, I think they need to provide more real aspects of what it is. You've had some pretty neat experiences with us here at the funeral home, yeah. um, getting to sit in through arrangement conferences, whether it's on the pre-arrangements or an at need. I think that's really important because I know that we're missing out on some of these day-to-day -day operations of what a funeral director or what it is at the funeral home. Now, this is a little controversial, but I always said <laughs> that I feel like funeral directing could be almost a trading school to where you go and learn the information and you don't take such a huge test that you're studying for to then forget most of the material and go do it real hands-on, where in a trading school you can learn the material, do a smaller tests to where they can actually prove that, okay, she knows, he knows. Um, the information that we've provided and then sure. they can get that real hands-on yeah. activity I, with other funerals. I know Indiana used to have a split license that used to be you could be a funeral director or you could be an embalmer. Now it's all, wrapped into now one. It's all in one. So I would have I would have been interested to see the curriculum requirements and testing requirements is it more of a trade school to be a funeral director where you're making arrangements and conducting the funeral service? You don't necessarily need the science side of things where you do as a prep person in the back working with the deceased. That way you know what you're potentially being exposed to and what your chemical makeups are. Um, some of the downfalls that I felt that I've seen in mortuary school and I've shared them with you is they didn't prepare me to meet with families, even though we did have a good chunk of time where we talked about arrangement conferences and building relationships and talking with families. And I know that your program didn't offer that very well. So I'm glad you got to experience that here. The other side that I think that they're really lacking is on the embalming side. And I know that 
when we've worked together and embalmed, like you've asked questions, um, it's not even like the procedure or process of embalming. It's more of like the chemical selections. And we've, we've talked this it over. It gets rushed past. It, there, there's really no discussion of it. It's this is an arterial solution. This is a co-injection. This is a pre-injection. <laughs> this is a humectant. And this is a specialty You'll fluid. You'll get That's the all bare you need minimum to know. knowledge of right. like, okay, the humectant, like this yeah. is what it does. And you're like, that's it? So like, how much do yeah. I add? <laughs> and well, they're like, well, it depends on each body. And you're like, okay. Okay, so like, tell me what that parameter <laughs> yeah. is. Are we like, how many ounces is it? Yeah, I, it was definitely frustrating. Um, I don't think that it could get better unless you had, um, I don't want to name drop, but some of our well-known embalmers in our industry, we do continuing ed through conventions. These folks hold classes. They talk to us about embalming techniques. They talk to us about the restorative art side of things and reconstruction. But I, I think it would be neat, and it, it, I guess it wouldn't even need to be uh, an embalming specialist. It could even be these chemical reps or chemical companies having one of their specialists come and talk to the class. Obviously, they in a class period, you couldn't ever cover all their fluids, but they could get into a better description of, hey, this is an arterial solution, and we have them range from 15 to a 36. What does that mean? Well, that's your index. What does that mean? I've heard the term. We've talked what index is. Well, that's the concentration of formaldehyde or the glutaraldehyde in there. And here's why you may choose a lighter one or a stronger one. So I think there's there's some maybe changes in, in the industry that would be much more beneficial. I do feel as if my mm -hmm. restorative arts teacher, she did go over that well for us because she tried to put it as us actually working more than the test. That way when we go out into the world, we still have that knowledge, but we know exactly what she's talking sure. about. And she even had examples and it actually made me figure out and put that knowledge to work of what she was showing and explaining to us mm -hmm. and me going into the job field and being like, okay, I saw her um, explain this, so let me try and do this to help. Yeah. I think another thing that, um, that maybe the mortuary schools feel, it's something I've experienced and you'll, you'll, you'll get to experience this too as you go on. Um, each place uses different chemicals and they even though I order from Champion Chemical Supply Company and maybe another place you're at had Champion Chemical Supply Company doesn't mean we selected the same embalming chemicals from them to utilize I have preferences and they have preferences so um, I think maybe those mortuary schools, they just kind of, eh, we covered just the surface of it. When they get out into the industry, the funeral home is going to say, well, this is the chemicals that we use in this. Exactly. And you, you'll have those discussions with whoever the senior embalmer or funeral director is like, hey, I've never used this hydrochemical company. Like, can you like point me in a direction? And some of those funeral directors and embalmers, they may go, yeah, here you need these five chemicals to use. And that doesn't answer your question. You're, you're wanting to know like, hey, why, why, are we, what are, why are we using these three chemicals when I would typically just use this one chemical to achieve the same thing? Mm -hmm. So um, maybe that's probably the school's mindset and thought that the funeral homes are gonna kind of cover that, maybe even on the arrangement side, but I don't feel that maybe sets you up as a... It can be a risky business doing that. Sure. Because then we can go in and get somebody that's kind of burnt out in our industry. And then oh. you can be taught by them something that maybe you shouldn't have been taught. Or maybe they just don't want to teach anymore. So they're just like, well, you'll figure it out. Yeah, unfortunately, we see a lot of people that are... Um, what you call burnt out in our industry. They've, they've exhausted all of their energy and 
Um, it's sad, um, but we, we see it quite a bit. It's always uh, important for self-care and to have your time away from the funeral home, uh, no matter what your role is, whether you're the person that's greeting them or the guy in the back or lady in the back that's doing the embalmings and removals. We each need our own time to recover from our experiences, um, as I've, I've mentioned before, you know, these deaths that the families are experiences, experiencing, they are similar losses to us. They may not impact us near as, as greatly as you, but it's a burden we carry with you as well. So um, it's definitely important to get that self-care and have that time out of here. I hope they promoted that at, at school yes. for you. It was something they promoted for us. Um, it took a long time to understand what that meant, but as time went on and I got to that burnout and frustrated point, I realized what they were talking about and how important it is to go. Um, so, what other questions may I ask you about mortuary school? Um, what is your least favorite thing about the program that you were in? Was it the commuting? Was it trying to figure it out on your own? Was it maybe the diversity of students and teachers that you were exposed to? Was it not having it all in one facility that you were kind of bouncing from school to prep center to a different prep center than to your job? I would say I didn't mind the diversity. It was actually nice because then you could see um, where everyone came from and what brought them here. Yeah. Um, commuting definitely was not fun. I wish that everything was in one whole area to where like I didn't have to drive to Flanner to go do my embalming. Sure. I could have done it there at school with the teacher. That way I knew I was being taught everything that I possibly could. Absolutely. And that was a big thing for me was I learned from so many different people that I was able to grab different mm. techniques and knowledge from that person. That was able to help me, but I know others that have stayed for one funeral home throughout the whole mm. year. And they're like, well, how do you know that? And I'm like, well, I learned it at this place, sir. Right. And I'm able to explain my experiences. And that's also the good part about having diverse people is different experiences of what they're experiencing at one funeral home could be completely different from what I'm getting. Yeah. So mine was all in one building, same group of people every day, same teachers every day. Um, and I know you and I had conversation at one point that it's okay to go have experience elsewhere because you're going to see really great things and you're going to see really terrible things and I can tell you how terrible it is but to see it go down or see how terrible it is while they're going through that uh, those are experiences that you will never forget mm -hmm. vice versa how great this procedure or topic is that you're wanting to, to go over with the family, it, it it's important to see how it's handled by everybody because you're going to have an opportunity to learn off of that. Um, and there's still nothing wrong with it's mom and dad's business, it's fourth generation, I'm going to be the fifth generation and this is what we're going to do. That that's There's nothing wrong with that. that there's, there's a time in and a definite place for that to be. People like tradition, they like ritual, this is where we've always gone. Um, but just being open and in tune with the changes I think is important with those locations as well. Oh, yeah. So um, I guess I'm going to ask you, do you have, because I do, do you have any interesting mortuary stories that you would like to share whether it's a removal experience it's a funeral service experience or a phone conversation was there anything so far that you were like 
wow, that was really crazy, or man, that made a really big impact in my life. Like, that person didn't realize what they'd said to me made a big difference, and it's going to keep me going down this path. Or, ooh, that was terrifying. Is this really what I want to do? I don't necessarily have any crazy stories. Sure. But I do love when families come up and thank you and hug you and give you all their love after serving them. Yeah. That's, that makes me want to keep going. Even if I'm in a dark place, mm. it makes me see the brightness sure. of what we do. Yeah. For sure. Creating that last memory for somebody, it's... It's an undescribable feeling. It's not many people in the world that have a job like ours that it's not a monetary benefit by any means. It's a personal benefit. It's a personal reward. Um, and as you go through this, you're going to experience some of these families that they're not happy with themselves. They've went through a terrible, tragic death. They're bitter. And no matter what you do say or offer them, it won't make any difference. Um, so just always remember to kind of keep the positive mindset that you are making a good impact on those. And um, they may not see it right at the moment, but they'll come back to you later and thank you. Um, so I'm really excited to hear that come from you because I know you've not experienced funeral service at all. <laughs> this is where you learned about funeral homes and funeral service. You had a little bit of experience in your hometown. Um, they just basically pulled the blind back and let you see a little bit and then I brought you in and I said I'm going to show you everything and it may be absolutely crazy but um, I want you to know what funeral service is before you jump in head first. And you were always there are you good? Is this too much? Are you, yeah. you understanding? Do I need to explain anything? Uh -huh. That helped me along the way be able to be comfortable in asking questions and mm. being here. Yeah, because these families that we're, we're working with, um, it might not be their first loss, but it's their first close loss. Mm -hmm. So um, it's okay to say, hey, this is new to me as well. Like, can we, can I ask you a question? Like, how did mom come from Germany to Indiana? Like, that's crazy in, in my eyes. Oh, they were an immigrant or dad was in the military and my, mom over there and they got married and then came to the United States and that's when I come along. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of neat to be able to, to feel comfortable to ask those questions. Um, definitely as a new person, you feel like, I've got my worksheet, like, city of, of birth, okay, mom's name, all right. I'm really intrigued on how she came from Germany, but I can't ask that one. Dad's name, but you're in your mind still questioning that Germany thing, and you're hoping they give you a clue um, to lead into that. So I'm going to share one of my stories with you. So um, I want to talk about a removal experience that I had um, in northern Indiana. So here I was, I was working my normal day, it was nine to five, I'm sorry, eight to five, um, and I'm driving home, listening to Sublime, life's great, and I pass a doctor's office. And there's caution tape all the way around the property. There's all these police cars, no ambulances. There's the coroner's truck that's there. I'm seeing across the street, there's all kinds of news media. And I'm, oh, well, that's weird. Oh no, and I'm on call tonight. Great. So I get in the house and I tell my wife, um, hey, you know what's going on down the road? Like at the doctor's office, there was all these police. No, I so, said, well, I'm on tonight and I don't know if I'm gonna get called out to this coroner's call or not, but it didn't look pleasant. 
So we start cooking dinner and dun 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 dun, the phone rings. It's Central Dispatch. Hey Jeremy, uh, we have an, a situation at the doctor's office. Um, would you be available to help transport one of the deceased to the hospital for autopsy? Sure, one of the deceased though. Do I need to bring two cots? Because I can get two in the van. We, I just make it real easy for everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, the funeral homes, they got paid a little bit for the removal for the coroner's office. And I was thinking, shoot, we get two for one trip. This is gonna be great okay. for us. <laughs> And they said, no, we're only going to have you take one as we conclude the investigation on the other. Interesting. At the doctor's office, what could have gone on? Like, and it wasn't um, a primary care physician. It was um, another type of doctor's office. Um, and we walk, we, we get in, we got the removal car and they lifted the rope up and we pull underneath the caution police and park by the front door and we're greeted by several detectives and they said we needed a body bag and we needed to put on shoe covers. Typically we didn't wear shoe covers and I thought that's even more interesting, like why do we need shoe covers? So we get our cot out and we put our shoe covers on and we get in the front door and I walk into the lobby and it's like a normal doctor's office, except nobody's there. They got the receptionist and I'm looking and waiting like I thought maybe somebody come in who was upset and shot somebody. Mm. Um, that ended up not being the situation. Um, the, it was a murder suicide is what it come down to. Um, there were some bad business practices that were going on. I don't want to go into too many great details because it might lead to you discovering who these people are and I want to give the family privacy and respect. But um, the husband ended up shooting the wife and then he shot himself and the office door was closed and you can see people are around. And, they were almost like anticipating to see what our reaction was. Like it, it was really weird. And they open up this door and there sits a gentleman at the front of his desk that shot himself in the head. And there's this massive pool of blood on the floor that's coagulated. And then there's blood splatter all over the walls, on the ceiling. And then there's a lady laying on some blankets, it's like they made a pallet on the floor for her. And the coroner said, you're getting that one over there on the floor. And I'm like, wouldn't it make sense to take the guy at the, at the, the desk first? Because like, we're gonna have to walk over him, carry the cot, I'm not trying to clean the wheels later. Like, can't we just get the first one and then throw something over the blood and then get the second one? No, nope. we've got more pictures and more to investigate. Okay, so the lady was on her side facing the wall. We rolled her on her side. She was shot in the chest a couple of times and then once in the head. Um, we got her loaded onto the cot in the body bag. We had to leave the cot down to the floor, pick it up, so we could both get over the said blood pool. Uh, we managed to keep our wheels clean. Our shoes, not so much, but we had shoe covers on, which was fine. We were able to throw those away. And then we transported to the hospital for them to do an autopsy. Another firm that we were attached with went to retrieve the husband. Um, so yeah, that was one of the most interesting things that I would got to go through and I get home and my wife's got dinner finished. I'm excited, we turn on the news. And there I am, six oh. o'clock news. They got me coming out of the doctor's office, me and the owner's son and we we're walking out and we have our professional business look on, our nice suits and 
Uh, Straight face, I hope. Yeah, absolutely. And here we are. <laughs> we made the news and I sent a clip to my parents and, and all that. So it was kind of interesting. That was my first real like experience of being on TV and being involved with the funeral home, um, getting to do removals like that because my coroner's experience prior to that was actually involved with the coroner's office and not the funeral home like that. So that's one of my neat stories. Um, I think it's pretty interesting to see how that manner of death went down and how they investigated it. It did not go so well for the family. Um, they had to pay a lot of back in restitution for things that they were doing, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, so that's one of my neat, neat and crazy stories. I know it's one you, <laughs> you haven't had an opportunity to hear here. Um, I've shared some pretty crazy ones that, uh, probably won't make it to the show, um, until I can figure out how to describe it to you folks without being too mean. But this does conclude our services here at City of First Cremation and Funeral Services. Erica, thanks for being on the show. I hope thank you, you enjoyed it. Me. And I thank you all for listening and watching. Please like, subscribe, and share. Follow along to the Kokomo Lantern and keep watching for our future episodes. But this does conclude our services. Thank you for being in here. Bye.